Thank you, everybody. Now, I've given myself the death spot. I think it was only reasonable of me, this, this one straight after lunch where you all want to go to sleep. So I've come to wake you up. <laughs> We're going to talk about a workshop we did in June, I think, yes, June, which is a collaboration between uh, five organizations, so that was the Institute of Urban Design, um, MIT Innovation Node, and our three partner universities, University of Hong Kong, uh, City University, and Chinese University of Hong Kong, and we've done some research, or we're in the process of doing more research, so I want to share that with you. And to wake you up, we're going to have a video. Um, we, can, we can have a lot of design um, methodologies to help uh, improve the urban realm and then uh, uh, improve the working, uh, work, work, uh, uh, working environment and the living environment and how to uh, navigate the city. And um, taking into account that at Aldri we have a very, not, not very good eyesight. I, I believe that the road signs, all the signs and needs to be uh, clearly visible for the for the elder as well. Feels like actually right away I'm getting a little a lot older um, because it's heavy and then uh, my costume is designed to be like a lot bendy. So my back is totally rounded. So it feels really like like old people that I never experienced before. My back started to ache already. We just came down and the mid-level escalator has changed its direction, so I have to walk the steps and it's horribly difficult uh, it's hard to see i don't know where I, whether it's safe to step so it's it's difficult children like with three children it's slightly different but also mobility restricted in the same way especially if carrying one of them away with a stroller it's extremely different i mean a few minutes of walking down the slope it's definitely very difficult in Hong Kong when people have to navigate the slopes where they're coming up or coming down. Um, I found that like the handrail is definitely very helpful um, to keep a lot of safety. Um, you can either hold on to it or lean on to it. Um, but like the floor service is also very important. I think a lot of the manhole and drain location didn't take into account. Of, um, old people may be walking along here. So. There's a lot of plenty of uh, snow, plenty of staircase, which is really fear, especially today, the humid uh, climate. Uh, I'm really afraid of the sleepy floor. So when somebody wants to overtake, uh, overtake me, it's really scary. me. It was quite difficult to find. Uh, the signs were very high and the letters were very small, so I couldn't read them. And um, I had to really look very hard. Yeah, it is possible to cross the road with the traffic lights. Then I also still need to be very cautious to make sure that the traffic has stopped. As she might be feeling pain in her body. She might be uncomfortable in the really hot weather. She feel powerless um, being on busy streets and not be able to control her body fully. But after today, I can actually, I don't just understand her, I can empathize with her. Because when I was um, constrained by the elder suits, my back was hurting, my knee was hurting, my shoulders were hurting, all these signals, uh, the facial cues, the noises on the street just becomes really irritated. So I now know the difficulties experienced by the elderly and then friends. I go back to my office and then I start to design our own plan. I know what needs to be done. So I think if we want to uh, design better street, the most important thing is for street designers to actually experience what it's like to be that type of user. 
that all of them should have the chance to be in this elder soup, which I think is a privilege that I have experienced today, how elderly actually feel walking on the street. So we've moved on to streets now. We're off the big transport systems. I've gone a slide too far, maybe. Oh, no. Okay, that's the right one. Um, so we're going to get into the nitty-gritty this afternoon about our urban environment. And that was our June um, experience of trying to get people of, of all ages and, ex uh, and, and backgrounds to understand what it's like to get older. And it's not new, it's something we did before in 2018 in a previous conference. Uh, and we've run this workshop twice before. Um, there was this one in Saing Pun, and then we ran a second one in Causeway Bay with, with young students um, to really try and let them understand that design is more complex when it's going to be inclusive. So the idea of these workshops was that we would ask people what their expectation was of the trip before they changed into their elder suit and then we'd survey them again with the same question after and try and see, you know, did Hong Kong meet that expectation? Um, and in, in the past, we, uh, we had some results. So I just very quickly share them with you in 2018. Um, this is before wearing them and then after. So you can see the change after experiencing it finds the city is not very conducive to getting older. Um, and there's been a big movement from uh, uh, the, the, the red and the orange then um, in, into this red zone. And this was also borne out by young people when we added them in. Um, so 33% with our, our sample, and then the second one was 36%, so it even correlated with the first. And then we did a wide survey, the same, on Facebook, what do you think um, Hong Kong is like? And you can see that that third sample is representative expectation. So people think the environment is better than it actually is once they walk it. So that, that's the, the point I'm trying to prove. And we had a nice conference, and we discussed all those um, and we had a workshop and we advocated lots of change and that was five years ago and so I wondered if anything had changed, had the message got across. So uh, these were our objectives and, and mission of that time to try and show these deficiencies in the, in the urban environment. And so I've used that to propel our, our latest research but we've gone wider, it's not just elderly now, it's a, an inclusive environment. So we've looked to spread out that, um, let, let me call it uh, handicapping, from not just our aging suits, but we, um, we've looked at, at disabilities. So we're introducing wheelchairs, and we've looked at, at what I call encumbrances, which are um, ended up being some baggage. And, and this is what it's like. So uh, we sent out teams across Hong Kong in five different locations of five people. And as you can see, it needed five because somebody's got to push a push chair um, and somebody's got to take the video because we're actually doing some mapping of the experiences that people are going through and, and what decision making they are doing. So these were our five test sites, and they were designed to give us different kinds of urban setting in Hong Kong, all, all very different. Um, and we chose to share those out amongst our, our different research groups. And the one I'm going to share today with you is one of, one of the areas, which is uh, Sham Shui Po, which is in the middle of Kowloon for those that are, are not too familiar with Hong Kong. Um, and this area is kind of, uh, uh, of a mid-age development. It's not, not some of the oldest, and it's certainly not some of the, the newest. And the reason I'm sharing it to you is because Gianni gave me all his um, stuff first to share with you. So, well, thank you to City U on that. So we did the same thing, before and after survey. This, not actually those questions, um, some slightly different questions because we're being more inclusive. But, but what happened? So we asked f essentially questions in five different areas. 
Um, adequacy of space for walking, pleasantness of walking environment, connectivity to facilities, ease of navigation and safety of walking. And the dark green is after is what they think after in the survey after they've gone out with their wheelchair or their baggage or their, their elderly suit and the, the lighter green is before and and i think the overall um interest from these is the results are not as conclusive as they were five years ago actually they're not too different so either the expectation of people has changed or the environment's got better uh, that, that's what I'm taking from it. Um, sure, there are, there are some differences, but, but we're quite surprised by them, how, how different it is from last time. So let's have a look at those five areas in a little more detail. Um, we looked at seven different criteria under adequacy of space. Um, I'll let you read those. I don't like reading them out, but uh, we've tried to cover the expectations in, in those areas. Um, and it's quite hard to get all that data in your brain and fathom it out. So I'm going to cheat and give you my conclusions, which are this. So the, the first bit is about um, after the experience, what was actually better than you expected? So not bad. For actually, in this area, five um, aspects were actually better than an anticipated beforehand. So this is quite surprising. However, some of those still have very poor provision. So um, even though it, it's better, it's still not very good. So it's the same things that we might expect. Design for older adults hasn't seemed to have improved since five years ago. Um, navigation with luggage, which is a new criteria we've added, has proven problematic. Um, and space for wheelchairs. So the three things that we've introduced still remains poor. Let's look at the kind of environment. Do we want to get out of our, our building or our tube and actually go and walk on our streets? Is it pleasant and encouraging us to take a, take a trip? So six criteria. Um, I'm letting you see the criteria. I'm not going to let you think too long about what those mean because it's a bit fuzzy. But I've summed it up here. So actually, People felt that the greenery of the city was um, better than they'd, they'd expected and that the routes were quite interesting. So uh, there's a positive. However, they still felt that the greenery wasn't good enough. It was poor and they still felt that the attractiveness of the route was poor. So they thought it was going to be really, really bad. It was just bad. Um, and I think a key one that comes out of this is seating and, seating and affordances, which, which came out as a clear thing that there was not enough um, particular seating or other affordances to let you take a rest. And that doesn't matter whether you're elderly or young or uh, 29 years old like me. And the third thing, uh, how did our, our network connect? So uh, eight criteria. And this, I think, is, is where the results were really quite positive all round. People expected great connectivity, and generally, they got it. Um, and you can see there's, there's not huge uh, disparity. It, um, e even public toilets were exactly what they expected. I'll summarize this for you and say that actually people found parks and playgrounds were quite well connected, which is, is something I'm always suggesting is, is not the case, so I, I'm corrected there. But poor provision for connectivity to schools, which I think is really interesting, um, especially in terms of what we heard this morning about um, school zones, and I think we were talking about them in our webinar yesterday as well, about how important it is um, to have really well connected walking at schools. Um, criteria four. four, four criteria here. Um, and this is really about um, wayfinding. And of course, what, what had happened is we've given everybody an, an app to find their way. Um, and that's why the digital navigation question comes in. And look, and 
and all these young people at the beginning, 100% of them said, I definitely need, will need my app. I can't find my way around the city without an app, which is quite interesting. But 15% of them changed their mind after they'd walked the routes. They found that there was some, some degree of uh, orientation possible. So here's to summarize that for you. Um, Yes, maybe we can not just look at our phones to get around the city. Maybe there are other important methods to help us navigate. Um, that generally, crossing points were better highlighted than anticipated, and that um, there were probably more crossings than people anticipated. So a, a better result. But again, the expectation was quite low. So um, waymarking still wasn't good enough. On the whole, digital navigation was essential, um, and there was still an insufficiency of crossings, even though it was better than expected. And into Julian's uh, favorite subject, safety. So we've got uh, another seven criteria. Again, nothing too um, outrageous. Um, generally, people felt that traffic did what it was supposed to do. Um, the vehicles were following the rules. Walkways were um, well defined, often by by greenery, um, and that there was um, better shade than they expected. However, that shade was still not good enough and well below what was needed. Um, that actually the streets, and this is, is quite an interesting one, were overcrowded and threatening, um, and. Uh, there were not enough design measures against falling. Um, now, this is quite interesting. So these young people are, have uh, decided that you know, I, I could slip, and we heard it in the video there. I could slip, I could fall, there's a lot of steps. Um, so unfortunately, it, imp it implies Hong Kong doesn't have enough barriers or, or safety rails. <laughs> so uh, I, I might not show that one to people in future. <laughs> Um, so that was the first bit, the survey. Then we've gone on and, and done something a little bit more. So all these students, we, we've tracked them. So they've got GPS tracking, so we can see what route decisions they're making and what um, kind of uh, human decision making they're, they're doing on this, this wayfinding trip. Um, so I've put together this because otherwise I don't understand what I'm doing. So uh, essentially, they were starting from a, um, a, a main facility and they had to get to the MTR. So a typical uh, journey for all of us and they were within 500 meters. So within our, our walking distance of a, of a daily commute perhaps to, to work or, or, or shopping or visit friends. So a typical Hong Kong trip. On that route, you need to be able to have a public toilet. You need to do that because we all, we all need that confidence to know that we can visit a toilet if, if we have to, especially as we get older. On that route, you had, they had to visit a uh, snack stand to get a drink or some food, so again, a, a, a standard thing that they might do on, on a commute, and you had to cross at least one main road. So imagine this is happening in five different districts with five different groups and five wheelchairs and five cases and lots of um, cameramen. So that's straight. Off we go. We use the guide. It says go, go this way, and then off they go. But then, of course, there are blockages on the way. There are surprises, and route decision-making has to change as they go along. Um, because there are unexpected things. So what decisions were they making when they had to make choices? Um, how much information did they have about the environment around them to make correct choices? Um, and, and would they take longer paths if perhaps they were easier or didn't need to cross a road? These kind of things are, are what we're looking at. So. Here they are, they've got, they've got uh, cameras on their helmets and they're out on these streets doing this, uh, this typical type of journey. And this is the um, study route from Sham Shui Po. And in fact, this, this one's interesting because um, they were indecisive and, and took two routes. They so we've actually got a comparison between two different ways of doing the same route. And 
the idea with this now is that we can actually look at, at how that maps and um, see if one is more suitable for walking than the other. So we're starting to look at the spaces involved around those decisions and what's actually happening there um, and then how the humans are interacting with their environment. So these are all the elements that we find along those two routes. Um, you can see all sorts of things. So they may be fences or they may be trees that, that give you shade. Um, we, we've tried to put in everything that we could map spatially. And then we've also analyzed the activities going on from other people during these um, routes. So does that affect your decision making? Um, you know, do you want to go where there's more people? Do you want to go where there's less people? Um, are there things going on that you want to avoid or you're attracted to? So we're, we're kind of looking into that. And there's the, the heat maps of use of these spaces along these two routes. And then putting that all together, we then break down those activities and try and look at the different types of activity happening in those spaces. So it's getting a little bit more complicated again. We've got now five groups and five routes and two routes and lots of activities and lots of data being collected. So we can then break down all of that into these different activities, where they're happening, how does that happen in relation to the spaces, and what decisions have they made on their choices because we've mapped them. So it's getting quite complex. Now this is just for the Sham Shui Po one. We actually have um, five sets of data to go through and then we can compare, um, because they're different types of spaces, what's uh, more appealing in terms of making a walkable route or, or what affordances are there. And hopefully it will give us a little bit more data to justify some of our, our decision making and build on, on what we learned from our, our previous um, research. So, so I've been very quick, I think. Um, what we're doing next is we're going to collect the rest of the data from all the groups um, and then we'll be able to cross-reference all that and see what it, it gives us. And the object, of course, is to be able to give better information to government so that they can form better policy and make better decisions and we get better outcomes. Um, simple as that. So this is ongoing. Um, I've, I've just wanted to share with you today where we are and I hope um, next year, if you're all out here, I can, can give you an update on where we are. and. Uh, we, we should be publishing some papers on this and that should um, confirm some results in a more scientific method than I've given you in my presentation today. So thank you everybody. <laughs>